In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today, through the grace of God, we will continue with chapter 11, uh, 10 from the letter of St. Paul to Hebrews. In all the previous chapters, St. Paul proved the superiority of Christ's ministry and Christ's work. Now St. Paul will shift to what is accomplished in the life of the believers because of what Christ has done. We said now Christ opened an access to God. Christ offered himself as a sacrifice. Okay. How is this going to affect my life? The main point St. Paul will try to emphasize here in chapter 10 that this sacrifice, this unique sacrifice of Christ helped in cleansing my conscience. Before Christ I have a conscience of sin. But now through the sacrifice of Christ this conscience can be cleared. The Levitical system failed in cleaning my conscience from sin and creating a clear conscience. But the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ succeeded in cleansing us from sin and creating a clear conscience. So, in the first four verses of chapter 10, St. Paul elaborates on the ineffectiveness of the Levitical law. How the Levitical law and the Levitical uh, system of sacrifices and priesthood was ineffective in clearing my conscience. So he started by saying, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. So, St. Paul here is saying that this system, the Levitical system, cannot perfect those who approach God. Cannot make those who are trying to approach God perfect. Why? He gave two reasons. Number one, because it is the shadow and not the very image of things. And we spoke about the shadow. It is a copy of the real things. It's not the real things. So because it is the shadow and not the real things, that's why it can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach, who approach God perfect. And St. Paul is emphasizing again, the fact that it is done every year, and the fact it is the same sacrifices, the sin sacrifice, the trespass sacrifices, and uh, the fact that it is repeated by the priest and the high priest, so this means that this Levitical system couldn't perfect those who want to approach God. That is the first reason. And the second reason he mentioned in verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Usually, the sacrifice of the greater for the lesser is adequate, not the opposite. Christ is greater and we are lesser than him. So, when he offers himself as a sacrifice for us, yes, his offering can cleanse me from my sin. But the opposite, a sacrifice of the lesser on behalf of greater cannot be adequate. 
and the bulls and goats are lesser. They are animals. So in no way the sacrifice of the lesser of the animals can take away the, can take away the sin from my conscience. So these are the two reasons. Number one, the Levitical system is a shadow, not the real. And number two, the sacrifices are the sacrifices of the lesser on behalf of the greater. And this will never be adequate. Verse 2, St. Paul is saying, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? If the Levitical system is adequate, then this offering had to be ceased. But the fact it's offered year after year, this means, you know, it is ineffective. It is inadequate. For the worshippers, once purified, would have, not, would have had no more consci consciousness of sin. So, if I am really purified, then I wouldn't have a conscience of sin. And if I don't have a conscience of sin, then I don't need the sacrifice. The fact that these sacrifices are repeated every year, this means we are not purified. We are not purified. That's what he is trying to say here. For the worshippers, once they purified, if they were really purified, would have no more consciousness of sin but because they were not purified that's why they offer these sacrifices every year verse 3 but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year so every year both us and God we remember sin when we offer these sacrifices every year on the Day of Atonement, we know that our sins are not forgiven. That's why we offer it every year. We know that these sacrifices are an, an inadequate to purify me. And also God still remembers my sins because these sacrifices didn't please God. These sacrifices are not sufficient to atone my sins. That's why in every year there was a reminder of sin every year. Now from verse 5, St. Paul, after he explained and he gave two reasons why the Levitical system was inadequate, in verse 5 he is explaining the superiority of Christ sacrifice. So what is the solution? What is the solution? These sacrifices cannot clear my conscience. He starts by saying, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, when he, he referring to Christ. So when Christ came into the world, he's speaking here about his incarnation. When he came into the world, he said, and the word, the word, he came into the world, means he existed before he came to the world. And now when he entered, you know, it's different than when he was born in the world, you know. So because God, the Son, Jesus Christ, existed from beginning, he's infinite. But at the time of his entrance into the world, he said, and when he said, this was a prophecy about Jesus Christ in Psalm 40, verse 6 to 8. And St. Paul used here the Septuagint version. Because if you looked at the Psalm 46 to 8, you will like different, different words. Because the word here in, in New King James are not the Septuagint translation. But if you compare what is mentioned in chapter 10, with the Septuagint translation, you will find it identically. And that's why the Septuagint is the authorized translation of the Old Testament in the Orthodox Church. When Christ entered in the world, he said the following points. Number one, 
you did not desire sacrifices. Here the son is talking to the father. So the son is saying to the father, you did not desire sacrifices. Because if you desired sacrifices, you know, you would be happy with all these sacrifices that were offered all these years. But you did not desire sacrifices. Which mean, when you sent me into the world, I, I am not coming to offer the same sacrifices of animals. No. But I am coming to offer another sacrifice. What is the sacrifice of Christ? He said, you prepared for me a body. What does it mean you prepared for me a body? This verse, it is not only about incarnation, that the world took flesh and dwelt among us. It's not about this. But it is about you prepared for me a body to offer it as a sacrifice. So when I came into the world, I'm not going... When I come to the world, I'm not going to offer sacrifices like the Levitical high priests. But you prepared for me, not animals, you prepared for me what? A body. To offer it as a sacrifice. And if this is your will, I will do your will. So there are three points the Lord Jesus Christ said when he entered into the world. Number one, you don't want me he is addressing the Father. You don't want me to offer animal sacrifices. Number two, but you prepared a body for me to offer it as a sacrifice. Number three, I am going to do your will. So what is the will of God the Father? The will of God the Father is our sanctification, but not through animal sacrifices, but through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the will of God. Uh, let's read these verses. Therefore, when he, Christ, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Here he is referring to what kind of sacrifices? Animal sacrifices. So, you are not expecting me, or you don't want me to offer again animal sacrifices. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But a body you have prepared for me. But you prepared for me a body to offer it as a sacrifice. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. So I'm not going to come to offer again burnt offering and sin offering from the animals. No. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. So, I, I have come into the world to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scripture. As it was prophesied about me in the scripture. And that's what the Lord did in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, what did he do? He said, it is not according to my will, but to your will. And here there is no contradiction between the will of the Son and the will of God, but it is a complete obedience of the Son to the Father. And as the Son obeyed the Father unto death, the death of, of cross, as St. Paul said in Philippians, that's why we need to follow his example and to be willing to obey the Father even unto death. As we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. Verse 8. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burn it offering and offering of sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. What is the first and what is the second? The first referring to the Levitical system, the animal sacrifices. And the second is, 
the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first is the first covenant, but the second is the new covenant. So now, when he said, you are not happy with this kind of desire of sacrifices, but I have come to do your will, this means he takes away the first covenant, he takes away the first system, he takes away the Levitical priesthood, and he established the second system, the uh, second uh, covenant, the new covenant. So the Old Testament, even the Old Testament, testified that the Levitical system is ineffective because these verses are taken from the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is the Old Testament. So even the book of the Old Testament testified that the Levitical system is ineffective. And the prophets were looking for uh, a new covenant in order to uh, atone our sins and clear our conscience. Verse 9, uh, verse 9, behold, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. This verse show what? Show the complete obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the Lord said to King Saul through Samuel, the prophet, that obedience is better than a sacrifice. And here just I want to highlight a very important point. If I offer a sacrifice, but not with obedient heart, it will not be accepted. But what makes me, or what makes my sacrifice accepted before God, it is the spirit of obedience. What made the sacrifice of Christ is accepted before God because he obeyed the Father. That's why obedience is more important than a sacrifice. Obedience is more important than a sacrifice. So, as the Lord Jesus Christ obeyed in the same way, in order for my sacrifice, which like a sacrifice of praise, like when I offer my body as a sacrifice, when I fast, when I worship the Lord, these sacrifices, in order to be accepted before God, it has to come from what? Obedient heart. Obedient heart, like the heart of Christ. Uh, verse 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. By that will, by that will, that's the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So, for the Lord Jesus Christ, the will of God included a sacrificial death uh, for our sanctification. A sacrificial death for our sanctification. And by that will, by this will of the Father, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And I want you here to focus about the word the body because St. Paul will repeat this word more than one time in chapter 10. So that is the first time he mentioned, actually the second time. The first time when he said, when I came into the world, you have prepared a body for me. This body now, he offered this body. And then St. Paul will refer to this body a third time in this chapter. But the Father prepared a body for the Son. And the Son now pre uh, offered this body on the cross because this is the will of the Father. And St. Paul will uh, make another reference to the body in this chapter. Now, from verse uh, 11 to verse uh, 14, St. Paul will reflect again on the priesthood of Christ. Christ as the new high priest. And St. Paul, every time, he adds something new. He adds something new 
about the superiority of the priesthood of Christ. The last point that he reached in, 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 in chapter 9, that he as a high priest was able to open an access to God, to break the veil. Now St. Paul, he will add a very new point to what he added before about the superiority of the priesthood of Christ. Verse 11, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Actually, this verse, verse 11, is similar to verse 10, but with one difference. Verse 10, verse, sorry, verse 1. Verse 1 was focusing on what? On the sacrifices itself. Let's read it together again, verse 1. For the law, having the shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with the same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. So here the focus on the sacrifices that are offered continually, year after year, year, after year but these sacrifices cannot make those who approach perfect. Verse 10, it's the same concept. The in, in, uh, effectiveness of the Levitical system, but he is focusing on the priests here. By saying, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. So again, he is uh, saying the sacrifices of the priests and the ministry of the priest wa was ineffective. Verse 12. But this man, this man referring to Christ, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. It's one sacrifice. And this sacrifice is forever. And that's why, as I told you, in the divine liturgy, we don't offer a new sacrifice. It's not. It is recalling. It is reliving. But it is not offering of a new sacrifice. Because he offered his body once for all. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Here I want you to compare between verse 11 and verse 12. He said about the priest, they stand. Every priest is stand ministering. In verse 12 he said, after he offered sacrifice, he sat down. The priest standing means their job is not yet done. As long as I'm standing, I'm still working. But when it is said about Christ that he sat down, this means his work is accomplished. Is finished. That's why he is seated. And this is the new point that St. Paul added to the superiority of Christ's priesthood here. That Christ, not only his sacrifice was sufficient for all of us, but as a result of the sacrificial death of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ has taken his seat at the right hand of God. As I told you, he will add a new element here. And what is this new element? He's speaking about Christ is seated at the right hand of God after he offered his sacrifice once for all. And St. Paul is referring to Psalm 110, verse 1, in which we read, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. The Lord first is the Father, the second is the Son. So the Father said to the Son, sit at the right hand. So, sitting down here marks the end of the day's work. So what is the message by St. Paul saying that he sat down, or he sat down, that the Christ work is done. And the right hand is the place of honor. So Jesus Christ now is glorified. 
as he said uh, in his prayer in John 17, glorify me with the glory that uh, I had before the foundation of the world. Verse 13, from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. In Psalm 110 verse 1, it says, sit at my right hand until I put all your enemies under your feet. So actually, St. Paul is referring to Psalm 110 verse 1. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And here I want to explain something very important. That when Christ said, it is finished, this doesn't mean that he subdued all his enemies under his feet. As St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Christ will reign until he will submit and subdue all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will submit is death. You know when? When all of us will be raised again. So death has no power. So not yet all the enemies are submitted to Christ. But when he said it is finished, that is the first uh, uh, step in this salvation was finished. But still until now, death is working and is not submitted yet. So Christ will sit at the right hand of the Father until all the enemies will be uh, submitted to Christ. After this, as St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he will give the kingdom to the Father. So, here there is already achieved tasks and not yet tasks. What do I mean already? You know, the salvation of the cross is already achieved. But the submission of the enemies is not yet. We are waiting for this. But because of what already was achieved, now we believe and we are confident that the not yet will be also accomplished. So, because of the already, like, you know, he finished the salvation on the cross, like now he is seated at the right hand of the Father, there is no doubt that the not yet, which is the submission of the enemies, would come. So why we believe that all the enemies of Christ will be submitted because he already achieved the first part, which is, you know, victory over Satan, uh, binding Satan, and now he is already seated at the right hand of the Father. Verse 14, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. By one offering, that is the offering of his body. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The Greek, uh, the Greek word for perfected and sanctified in this verse means actually it is a going on process. So, our perfection and our sanctification is ongoing process, day after day. Because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, now every time we sin, we come and we take forgiveness for our sins and we become sanctified. So, these two uh, functions, the work of being perfected and sanctified, goes on continually in our life. Why? Because of this one offering. And because of this, the access 
to the holy God is always available to us because now we are holy in Christ. You remember in the end of the divine liturgy, Abuna says what? The holies for the holy. The holies are the body and the blood. For the holy, who are the holy? It's us. So now because we are holy, there is access to the holy God. The veil is broken and we can approach God. So the Levitical system couldn't perfect those who want to approach God. But Christ was able to perfect us and to sanctify us so that now we can have access to God. Starting from verse 15, St. Paul refers again to the new covenant and its effectiveness. How it is effective in cleansing our conscience if it is compared with the old covenant. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. And here, witnesses to us is very important, the word to us. Because the Holy Spirit here is speaking to me. And as I told you before, when you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit did not inspire the Bible and that's it. But until now, every time you open the Bible, and you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit who inspired these words, the Holy Spirit through the same words speaks to you and bear witness to you. And the Holy Spirit is God. So if the Holy Spirit bear witness, then whatever he says, it is absolutely true. So the Holy Spirit did not only inspire Jeremiah, to write about the new covenant, but until now, he bears witness to me about the new covenant. That's what St. Paul is trying to say when he said, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, after he, he referring to whom? To the Holy Spirit. He didn't say after Jeremiah had said before, but he said after he. Because every word in the, in the scripture is the, the words of the Holy Spirit. After he, the Holy Spirit, had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law into their heart and in their minds I will write them. After he said this, verse 17, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So, after he spoke about the new covenant, and after he said about this new covenant, the Lord will write his commandment in my heart and in my mind, he said that their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. How these words bear witness to the sacrifice of Christ? Do you remember a few minutes ago I told you there was a reminder of sin every year. Reminder for us and for God. When we offer the sin offering, this means my sins are not uh, forgiven yet. And when God smells the sin offering every, every year, this means the sin offering is our sins are not forgotten, are not forgiven. But in the new covenant, see here the difference? Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Why? Because of this one offering of Christ. So the Holy Spirit actually bore witness through the words of Jeremiah that in the new covenant, there will be no remembrance of sin because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ forgive all sins for all people in all ages. All sins for all people in all ages. So the Holy Spirit here is bearing witness to us 
of the perfecting and sanctifying result of the sacrifice of Christ. Sacrifice of Christ made me perfect and made me uh, holy. But as I told you, perfect and holy, it is ongoing process. And it is the Holy Spirit uh, who brings the prophets of Jeremiah to reality in the death of Christ and in the life of the Christian. So the Holy Spirit inspired Jeremiah. The Holy Spirit bears witness to me and the Holy Spirit brings to reality this prophecy, the fulfillment of uh, the prophecy. Verse 18, Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Because our sins are forgiven, so there is no need for offering of sin. That's why there is no offering right now for sin. And as I repeated several times, the divine liturgy is not a new offering. Uh, Abuna, in the end of the liturgy, he says, I believe, I believe, I believe that this is the body which your only begotten son took from our lady, the lady of us all, the holy Theotokos and Mary. So this is not a new offering. It is the same offering. We are reliving and we're recalling the same offering. It is not a new offering. Because there is remission of sins. God already forgave our sins. So there is no need for another offering uh, for sin. Starting from verse 19, here St. Paul ended by verse 18, he ended all the theological discussion about the superiority of Christ and the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. Let me remind you uh, a little bit. St. Paul was addressing the Hebrews and the Hebrews are the Christian from Jewish background. And why he sent to them this letter? In order to warn them from apostasy, which is returning back to Judaism. So, in all these 10 chapters, until verse 18, he used many ways to prove to them the superiority of Christianity over Judaism. The superiority of Christ over angels. Superiority of Christ over uh, uh, Aaron. Superiority of Christ over Moses. Superiority of Christ over Joshua, etc. And the superiority of the priesthood of Christ as the sacrifice of Christ. By verse 18, he ended all this theological discussion. And from verse 19, he will draw some conclusions. And this was the way of St. Paul in all his letter. He started by making a theological discussion, and then he started to give practical application. And this is a very important point in studying theology. If you just study theology as a, a science in itself, without applying theology into our life, it has no value. But the purpose of studying theology and doctrine and dogmas, how these doctrines and dogma affect my personal life. So, starting from verse uh, 19, St. Paul is using the theological truth of the superiority of Christ as a basis for his spiritual exhortation. Now he will start to give them some practical and spiritual advices in their life. But he will build this spiritual exhortation on what? On the theological truth that he established about the superiority of Christ. That's why he started verse 19 by the word therefore. Therefore means what? After knowing all these facts, and now after you have been convinced that the new covenant is better, and Christ is superior, his priesthood is superior, his sacrifice is superior, therefore, I have something to tell you. What is this? Therefore, brethren, and he used here the word brethren, it's a word of love and closeness in order to get their attention. 
And also he is referring to what he mentioned before, that we are brethren of Christ. So all of us are brethren. Brethren of Christ because he is the son, but he is also our Lord and our master and our savior. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. This is number one. And number two, in verse uh, 21, and having a high priest over the house of God. So, here, St. Paul is appealing to two important truths that he had established. The first truth is, we have a great high priest over the house of God. And what is the house of God? Do you remember what he mentioned in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6? What is the house of God? His house is us. Yeah. And we are his house. We are his house. Verse uh, ch chapter 3 verse 6. We are his house. So, if Christ is the great high priest over his house, so Christ is our high priest. Christ is our high priest. So we have a great high priest. And number two, we have boldness to enter the holiest. Why? Why we have boldness to enter the holiest? He gave me a reason. Number one, therefore brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, number one, by the blood of Jesus. You know, the high priest in the Old Testament used to enter by the blood of animals into the Holy of the Holies. But Jesus did not enter into the holiest by the blood of animals. He entered by his own blood. And he opened the access to God. And now we have boldness that we can approach God because of the blood of Jesus. That's number one. And number two, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us. Because Christ opened for us new and living way. What is this new and living way that he consecrated for us? Christ is the pioneer and also the provider of this way. What do I mean the pioneer? He is the one who provided the way and he is the one who walked in this way as the first, as our first fruit. So he opened the way and he walked in this way. So he's a pioneer. He is the leader. He is leading all of us, as we see in the divine liturgy. Lead us throughout the way into your kingdom. Because he is the pioneer. So he's leading us in the way that he provided. And as he said, I am the way, so he is the way. Why he said a new way? Because it is a new access to God. A new access to God. And what is this new access? And this way also is living. Living because the way is Christ, and Christ is living God. And not only because it is Christ, but also it gives life to those who walk by this way. That's why it is a living way. If I walk down this way, I will be granted life. So it is a new and living way. Way means access to God. And what is our access to God? It's Christ. No one can come to the Father except through me. So Christ is the way to the Father. He is the way. And by the way, uh, all the disciples, all the followers of Christ, were called the followers of the way, as you read in the book of Acts chapter 9 verse 2. So when they say the disciples of the way, or follower of the way, means they are the, the Christian, the follower of Christ. So, why you have boldness? Because of Jesus entered into the holiest by his own blood, 
And number two, he opened for us a new and living way which he consecrated for us. Through the veil, that is his flesh. Through the veil, it's easy to understand. Because he opened the way through the veil. What does it mean? There was a veil separating God from us. And Christ destroyed this veil. He opened the veil. What happened on the cross? The veil was torn from upside to down. This means he opened this veil. So he opened this new and living way through the veil. But he said, through the veil, that is his flesh. And there are two ways to interpret that is his flesh. Either we, can, we say that is, is referring to the way, or that is referring to the veil. So, is St. Paul trying to say that the way is his flesh? Or he's trying to say that the veil is his flesh. You understand? Actually, both are correct. But most of the church father preferred the second. That when he spoke about the veil uh, as a flesh, he's saying that the veil is his flesh. Not the way is his flesh. And I will explain to you what does this mean. But let's understand the way. Because it is through the body of Christ, through his flesh, now we have access to God. Because God prepared a body for the Son. And the Son offered this body for our sanctification. So now this body became the way to heaven. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will have no eternal life abiding in you. But what does it mean? The veil is his flesh or his body. The flesh here refers to what? To our humanity. And this humanity, because of all its weakness, couldn't do the will of God. But Christ took this humanity and perfected our humanity and sanctified our humanity. And on the cross, he pierced his, uh, the, the, his flesh in order to open a way through the veil, through his humanity, through his flesh, through the piercing of his side. And from the side gushed for us water and blood. Water and blood for our sanctification. Water is baptism and blood is uh, communion. And St. Paul will speak in a few moments about the sprinkling of this water and this blood that gushed from the veil, from the body of Christ. So this veil was pierced on the cross and died on the cross and rose on the third day to open the way. So St. Paul is saying, uh, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that's his flesh. So the veil that was uh, separating us from God, which is our humanity, the weak humanity, Christ took it and sanctified it and perfected and pierced it on the cross in order to open a way for us to uh, access and to approach God the Father. And as I told you, he, he referred to the body of Christ three times. This is the third time. So see here how he is developing the, 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 the point of the body of Christ. Number one, when he entered into the world, the Father prepared a body for the Son. This body, what did he do with it? He offered it as a sacrifice for our perfection and sanctification. And now this body became, or through this body, now we have a new and living way to approach God. And that's why you have the body of Christ with us every day on the altar. Because it is our only access to God. There is no access to God except through the body of Christ. 
That's why he left his body for us on the altar every day. So, as I told you, St. Paul is building his spiritual exhortation on theological truth. What is the theological truth? He said two things. Number one, having a high priest over the house of God. Number two, we have boldness to enter into the holiest. How? Through the blood of Christ. And, uh, and how? By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is flesh. What we should do? Here, what St. Paul is saying. Let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. Now there is an access to God. You can approach God. You can draw near to God. You can abide in, in God. And God abides in you. So now you have boldness. And now you know there is access. Now there is a new and living way. Now there is a high priest interceding on our behalf by his blood all the time at the right hand of the Father. Now we have boldness. Let us draw near to God. And when we draw near to God, this will enable us to do things. Two things. Number one, to hold fast the confession of our faith. So we will not return back to Judaism. We will not deny our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when we draw near to God, and when we are one with God, now we can be strong enough to hold fast our confession. And because we are close to God now, we are one with God now, let us encourage one another. Let us encourage one another. Because the pressure of persecution was everybody. And many people wanted to return back to Judaism. But now, knowing that we have boldness to enter into uh, the holiest. And we know that we have high priest. We can encourage one another. So these are the three uh, conclusions that St. Paul made based on this theological discussion. Number one, let us draw near close to God. Number two, let us hold fast to our confession. Number three, let us encourage one another. Let's speak in detail about these three points. Quick details. Verse 22. Let us draw near. How to draw near to God? Now the door is opened. Just we can enter? No. No. There is some, you know, yes, the, the, the door is open. And the veil is, is broken. But do you remember uh, the parable that the Lord Jesus Christ said when the king sent his servants to bring, uh, uh, you know, uh, people from the streets to the wedding? And he found one person doesn't have the garment of the wedding and he kicked him out. So drawing near to Christ requires some, some points. How, how we, tr we, we draw near to, to, to God. He said, number one, with a true heart and full assurance of faith. This means what? That is the genuine faith without doubt. So how you draw close to God? Through faith. You have to have this genuine faith. The assurance of faith. No doubting that Christ is the only way to God. To, to the Father. That's number one, faith. Number two, uh, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Our heart, that's the inside, is sprinkled from an evil conscience. That is through repentance and confession. That's how we sprinkle our heart from the evil conscience. When I take responsibility of my sin, I confess it, I repent. Number three, and our bodies washed with pure water, which is baptism. So, and this is cleansing from inside and outside. Inside first to outside. But this doesn't mean that baptism is outside cleansing. But St. Paul is saying we need to clean from the inside in order for the outside to be clean also. So, he said let us draw close to God through three main things. 
genuine faith, repentance and confession, and baptism and uh, chrismation. So these are how to throw close to God. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Not only drawing close to God will make me hold fast to, the, to my confession, to the confession of faith, but also there is a reciprocal relationship here. But also holding fast to the confession of faith will make me closer to God. You understand? There is a reciprocal relationship here. So, as drawing close to God will make me strong enough to hold fast to my faith, the same, when I hold fast to my faith, this will make me closer to God. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. What's our hope? That's eternal life. So, let us hold fast to this confession, to this faith, that through Christ I will inherit the eternal life without wavering, without wavering, without doubt, without any desire to return back to former life or to Judaism. Why? Because we trust God. Because he who promised us the eternal life is faithful. Because he who promised us is reliable, is dependable. That's why we can hold our faith, our confession, without wavering. And number three. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So, here we will be saved together. Because all of us are members in the body of Christ. And this fellowship, this assembly of believers, is very, very important for our salvation. I encourage you and you encourage me. I support you and you support me. We will grow together, as St. Paul said in Ephesians. We will grow together. So let us consider one uh, another. It is the importance of the Christian fellowship or the support system. Why we consider one another, encourage one another? N uh, number one, to stir up love and good works. To stir up love and good works. And here just I want to say a quick word about the atmosphere in the church. If you enter the church and you find the atmosphere is atmosphere of hypocrisy, atmosphere of judgment, atmosphere of gossip, then we are not stirring up one another in love and good works. And we cannot bear witness that we are children of Christ. Because thus the world will know you are my disciples if you have love toward one another. So we as believers, what kind of atmosphere we have in our churches? Do we have this atmosphere of love or not? And good works or not? It's not enough to know the true dogmas and the true doctrines. But if this true dogma and doctrine is, are not translated in your practical life, it will avail nothing. That's why he said, let us stir up one another in love and good works. And number two, let's encourage one another not forsaking in the assembling of ourselves together. And usually, when the Bible refers to this assembly together, he's speaking about what? The divine liturgy. Because in the divine liturgy, we, all of us, we assemble together in the body of Christ. When we take communion, we, we become together. In communion, we become one union together. So there is no best assembly than the assembly of the divine liturgy. So, St. Paul is saying, if the manner of some is to skip from the divine liturgy or not to attend the divine liturgy, it's your responsibility to stir them up. It's not only the responsibility of Abuna to call the people and visit them and ask them why they did not come to the liturgy. It is our responsibility as believers to stir one another 
not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some. Number three, but exhorting one another and so much the more as the day approaching. Which day is speaking about here? The day of second coming. So, when the day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is approaching, we need to exhort one another uh, diligently and to eagerly encourage one another to grow in love and in good works. These verses are very, very important verses in the Christian fellowship, in our churches. What is my responsibility toward my brothers in Christ? You have responsibility to every person sitting around you now. You have a responsibility to every person that you know in the body of Christ. You have a responsibility. Don't say it's not my responsibility. Don't repeat what Abel said, sorry, Cain said to God, am I a guardian to my brother? Yes, you have a responsibility toward your brother to encourage him in love and good works, to encourage him to come to the church and attend the, the meeting and the assemblies, especially the divine liturgy. You have a responsibility to exhort one another to grow in, 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 in life of repentance and in the knowledge of, each, uh, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have responsibility toward one another. That's what St. Paul is saying. So, after he made this theological uh, truth, now he draws three conclusions. Number one, let us draw near to God. Number two, uh, let us hold fast to our faith. Number three, let us encourage one another. Then from verse 26, he is giving us the fourth warning. I told you in the beginning, the book of Hebrews has mean, how many warnings? Five. Five warnings. The first warning was the danger of neglect. Chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4. Second warning, the danger of unbelief. Chapter 3, from 7 to 19. Number 3, the danger of not maturing. Chapter 5, from 11 to 14. And we spoke about these three dangers. The danger of neglect, the danger of unbelief, and the danger of not maturing. Now, in chapter 10, he's speaking about another danger, which is the danger of shrinking back shrinking back he said for if we sin willfully if we sin willfully the word sin here means the persistent and continual pattern rather than a momentary slip so sin here doesn't mean just a person who slept and then repented but the person who abides in sin. And what is the sin? The main sin that he is referring here to is the sin of apostasy. Denying the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if we sin, if we deny our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the sin he is referring here, as he will explain later on. If we sin, if we deny the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we abide in this apostasy, willfully, willfully, means with my choice, with my free will. And he is referring here, as I told you before, to the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verse 27, when the Lord said, if you sin willfully, there is no sin offering for the sins that are committed willfully. So, if we deny the Christ, and if we abide in this denial, willfully, after we have received the knowledge of truth, after we, we knew the superiority of Christ, and that is there is no way except him to the Father, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. If one rejects Christ as the way of salvation, there is no other way made available. There is no other way. He is the only way. He is the only way to uh, uh, God the Father. So, after, if a person sins willfully, after he knew the truth, and there is no uh, longer remains a sacrifice for sins for, for this person, what he expects 
27. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. So this is what he will expect. There will be no longer a sacrifice of sin. But there will be a certain fearful expectation of judgment. The people will be afraid from the second coming. And here, St. Paul at the end of this chapter, he will say that the believer actually will be eager for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the second coming for them is the day of their deliverance. I mean, come, O Lord Jesus Christ. But for the sinners, they are so scared, they are so fearful from the second coming of Christ. Because this coming will be expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Those who resist the Holy Spirit, those who deny the Christ, those who abide in, in sin of apostasy. Verse 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. St. Paul here referring to Deuteronomy chapter 17 from verse 2 to 6. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 17 from verse 2 to 6, it's, it says that anyone who rejects uh, uh, Moses' law will die without mercy. Verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has? So, if you uh, violated the lesser, which is mother Moses' law, if you rejected the lesser, which is Moses' law, will die without mercy. What worse punishment do you expect a person who rejects the greater? And see here how St. Paul described apostasy. He described apostasy in very, very uh, scary words. He said, do you sub uh, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? So, St. Paul said, apostasy is trampling the Son of God underfoot. The Son of God who came to the world in order to save me. If I deny him, if I don't believe in him, as if I am trampling on him by my foot. Not only that, but I'm counting his blood, the blood of the new covenant that he shed on the cross for my sanctification and perfection. I count this blood as a common thing. And number three, I insult the spirit of grace because it is the Holy Spirit who uh, take from the uh, Christ and give to me. So I insult the spirit of grace who grant me all these benefits of the salvation uh, on the cross. Verse 30. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. These words are from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35 and 36. For we know him, he's speaking to, he is addressing Hebrews, who know the Old Testament very well. So they know these two verses. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. So, if I reject Christ, if I fall in apostasy, there will be vengeance because he appointed a day for recompense in which he will appear to judge the world in righteousness and give each one according to his deeds, whether good or bad. Then St. Paul concluding this uh, passage by saying, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fearful to whom? To the sinners. Fearful to those who abide in apostasy. But for the believers, it is joy. It's not a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
St. Paul is using sometimes he's warning them by explaining to them the danger of apostasy. And then he's encouraging them and appealing to the good things that they are in them. So he's using every way possible to persuade them not to deny Christ. So after this very uh, difficult, uh, not difficult, after these harsh words or, you know, uh, about warning them about the danger of shrinking back, now he's appealing to their perseverance from verse 32 to 39, the end of the chapter. He said, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Illuminated here, referring to what? Baptism. Because baptism is the sacrament or the mystery of illumination. So here we can replace the word illuminated by baptism. But recall the former days in which after you were baptized, you endured a great struggle with suffering. Usually when we start with Christ, we start with great love. And gradually we develop lukewarmness and we become lukewarm. So, St. Paul here is appealing to their previous perseverance so that they should continue to be faithful uh, and not let the present persecution to uh, accomplish what the previous uh, persecution had failed to do, which is to return back to Judaism. So he's appealing to the former days. Remember your former days. You remember your former faithfulness to Christ. Remember your former perseverance. Uh, remember these days. After you were baptized, you endured. You were able to endure through the grace of God a great struggle with suffering. How? Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations. So partly you yourself, we repro you, you were reproached and you, you suffered tribulation. And partly while you become companions of those who were so treated, by supporting those who were treated badly or uh, those who were persecuted. So whether you faced the persecution directly or you supported those who were persecuted, this is considered before God perseverance and good struggle. And he, he is reminding them that they supported St. Paul when he was persecuted. In verse uh, 34, For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. Had compassion on me and my chains, when we support a person who is persecuted for Christ, actually this is considered suffering for Christ. Even if, even if you yourself are not uh, facing this suffering, but supporting people who suffer for Christ, this is considered suffering for Christ. And accepted joyfully, joyfully here is a key word, joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, not regretfully, you accept it because sometimes I accept uh, the suffering because I have no other option. That's why I accept suffering. But here St. Paul is not speaking about the passive accepting of suffering, the passive accepting of plundering of the goods, but about the active accepting of suffering. Joyfully you accepted the plundering of your goods. Why? Knowing that you have a better and, and enduring position for yourself in heaven. Where is your focus? We need to shift our focus to heaven. And when we focus on heaven, then we will accept joyfully the persecution and suffering on earth. That's what happened with St. Stephen when he looked at heaven and saw the glory that's prepared for the saints. He despised the suffering and he asked God not to count this a sin for them. So St. Paul is saying here, it is our hope in heaven that will help us to be steadfast during the time of persecution. When we focus on heaven, when we focus on our eternal inheritance, this will make the suffering here on, on earth easy and will accept it joyfully. 
verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't cast away your confidence. This confidence in eternal heaven, in eternal uh, inheritance. Now, we know that we have boldness to enter into heaven. Don't cast away this confidence, which has great reward. If you hold fast to this confidence, there will be a great reward, which is the eternal inheritance. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You need endurance. The mentality right now when the church suffers is how to get rid of suffering, how to end the suffering. But here St. Paul is giving them another completely different approach. Not how to resist the suffering and how to end the suffering, but how to endure the suffering joyfully. How to accept the suffering joyfully. And how you can accept through endurance, through perseverance. For you, need, you have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. After you have done the will of God, he's referring here to whom? To what he just said about Christ when he entered the world, what did he say? I have come to do your will. And what's your will? You have prepared a body for me to offer. You asked me to die, and I accepted to die, because that is your will, thy will be done. That is his prayer in Gethsemane. So St. Paul is saying, as Christ fulfilled the will of God, this is the will of God. So, what is the will of God? To suffer for his name, to carry your cross, to endure this, to accept this. And if you accept the will of God, as Christ accepted the will of God, then you will be seated in the place of honor in heaven as Christ is seated in the place of honor in heaven. Do, do, do you follow what St. Paul is, is trying to say here? You may, have, uh, you may receive the promise. For yet, a little while, and he is coming. And he who is coming will come, I will not tarry. Actually, these verses uh, is from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, but again, according to the Septuagint. His, all, all his reference he made from the Septuagint. Habakkuk 2, verses 3 and, and 4. St. Paul, he is appealing to the second coming of Christ. Because as I told you, the second coming of Christ for the faithful is a joyful day, a day of deliverance. So he, he is telling them, endure, just be patient, wait. Because yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. So your suffering will be for a little. Just endure this little. And he will come and take you with him to heaven. Uh, now, the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If you are righteous, you need to live by this faith. The faith in the second coming. I mean, come, O Lord Jesus Christ. I know that you are coming to deliver me from the suffering of the world. I know that I'm, you are coming in order to reward me for all these days of tribulation. I am waiting for your coming. I'm living with this faith. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, but if I return it back to Judaism, if I return it back if, to my former life, if I deny to Christ, my soul has no pleasure in him. Christ will not have pleasure to him, in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. We are not from the people who return back and deny Christ because we are his children. But we of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We are from among the believers. The, those who have faith and this faith will deliver them. And here St. Paul sets the stage to chapter 11 in which he will speak about the faith of deliverance. The faith that will deliver me. So here just I want to conclude with this thought. The day of the second coming of Christ is a fearful day for you or a joyful day for you. If Christ comes this moment, right now, 
Are you will be among the fearful, those who are afraid from his second coming, or you will be among the joyful, those who will rejoice in his second coming. For those who abide in sin, this day is a fearful day. For those who live in faith, this day will be a joyful day. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I'll give you some questions to think about. Number one, why can't the blood... Why can't the blood of bulls and goats actually take away sin? Number two, how did the veil function in the Old Testament worship? Number three, what is the significance of the veil being gripped in two at Jesus' crucifixion? Number four, why is our access to God called a new and living way? And the last question, why is perseverance so important? Uh, let's answer these questions. The will of God is our sanctification through Christ's sacrifice. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the model of committed obedience to God. Obedience is better than a for the Lord Jesus the will of God included a sacrificial death leading to our sanctification. Sitting down versus standing marks the end of the day's work. So, Christ's work is done. Right hand is the place of honor. The work of being perfected and goes on continually in our life. It's an ongoing process. Let us draw near to God. And this will enable us to and very good. The fourth warning. If one rejects Christ as the way of salvation, there is no other way made available. Apostasy is number one. Number two. The blood of the covenant, a common thing. And number three. Let's pray. ليتراءف الله علينا وليباركنا ليظهر وكاه علينا ويرحمنا يا رب خل شعبك وبارك ميراثك ارعاهم وارفعهم إلى الأبد ارفع شأن المسيحين في كل زمان ومكان بإشارة صليبك المحي بالسؤالات والطلبات التي ترفعها لنا كل حين والدة الإله قديسة الطاهرة مريم وسائر صف الملائكة والأباء والأنبياء والرسل والمبشرين والإنجليين والشهداء والنساك والسواح والعباد المجاهدين الذين أرضوا رب عمان مصرح كل حين بركة ملاك هذا اليوم بركة قديس هذا اليوم بركة رئيس الملاك الجليل مخيل والقديس حنا المعمدان بركة سادات الأباء الرسل بركة ماري مرقس كاروس ديان مصرية والشهيد العظيم ماري جرجس بركة الأنباء أنطونيس والقوي الأنباء موسى بركة الأنباء أنس كاما بركة صوم السيدة العزراء مارت مريم بركة والدة الإله أولا وأخيرا بركتهم المقدسة نعمتهم قوتهم معناتهم شفعتهم وهباتهم تكون معنا جميعا أمين بإخريستوس بنوتي Oron te te hiri na moi nani te hiri ni simne nani te hiri ni kani novi nani volji thok te ti gom nampi on nampi smo nampi amah shani amin. O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for Thy is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever and ever. Now, love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace, may the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.